Lorraine. What do you want to do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. Friends, I want to talk to you today about some of the secret powers that are hidden within each one of us. Powers that are transcendent of our ordinary faculties. We are so used to thinking that we are made up of flesh and blood and bone and hair that we lose sight of the more subtle powers of the mind. Yet throughout the ages there have been those who have had powers that go way beyond known physical laws as we understand them. History is full of such records. and We have passed them over as being unusual and lost sight of the simple fact that everything is governed by law. It is only in recent years that we have discovered the relationship between the mind and the body. And at first it seemed impossible to believe that worry could produce a stomach ulcer, or that a person who is sensitive might have trouble with his throat, or that one who is in a continual mental and emotional confusion is more subject to having an ordinary cold than one who is calm and peaceful. So today, it is part of the ordinary procedure of a physician to inquire into the emotional reactions of his patient. And if you should go to a physician today and say, I am suffering with insomnia and break out with perspiration in the night and can't seem ever to get any rest, he might ask you, how are you thinking? in order to find out what is the nature of your inner complex. For the physician knows better than you do that a sleeping pill is no permanent answer to insomnia. And so he tries to find out the real reason for your restlessness, which often is some form of inner conflict, as though the mind were trying to go in two directions at once, and in so doing, keeping itself in such a turmoil that it can find no repose, even in slumber. Today, instead of saying or speaking of a healthy mind in a healthy body, we say that there must be a healthy mind if there is going to be a healthy body. And we now know that our mental attitudes have a direct relationship to other things in life. Today, we speak of people who are accident prone, those who are more liable to have accidents than other people. And important discoveries have been made along these lines. And it is now believed that 85% of our accidents are unconsciously invited. In light of these facts, I would like to suggest some other ideas that I think are of equal importance. Investigations now being carried on in quite a number of our universities in their psychological laboratories are showing us that the mind reaches out into the future and can, under certain circumstances, foretell just what is going to happen, just as it can reach back into the past and remember what already has happened. And the very latest discoveries at Duke University, under the leadership of, of Dr. Ryan, are collecting a lot of material which leads us to suppose that the mind is not confined to the body at all, but in, in many respects, the mind is completely independent of the body. I have no doubt that these new discoveries will lead to a complete acceptance of immortality. And I think it is wonderful that this investigation is being carried on independently of our dogmatic beliefs. They are being conducted in a scientific manner. And the evidence that is piling up will someday, I am certain, completely change our whole outlook on life. I believe that we shall come to understand that we are immortal right now. And I think it will show us that all people are immortal, not just some. And this is exactly as it ought to be, 
For you and I cannot possibly believe that this thing called life, which is God, has intended that some of us should be favored beyond others. Heaven can have no favorites. I believe it will be shown with equal certainty that our success or failure in life, whether we are happy or unhappy, whether we are prosperous or impoverished, is largely due to our mental attitudes, our faith and our fear. There is something else. Seems equally true to me, and I am sure it will to you. Every man has a direct inlet somewhere in his mind to the mind of God. If so then, why shouldn't we all become better outlets to the mind of God? Why shouldn't the mind of God flow through us and through our actions? Why shouldn't divine power animate everything we do? Why shouldn't the spirit, which is present everywhere, protect and guide and counsel and direct us? If it has been proved that the mind can look both forward and backward, then it has been proved with equal certainty that eternity is God's minute of time. And God's minute of the time is the time that you and I are living right now. It stretches backward and it stretches forward, but it is also present with us. We live in an eternal hour from which we may gather as much experience as much good or as much evil as we put into it. Now we all think of Jesus as the greatest man who ever lived. Yet it was Jesus who told us that what he was doing, we should be able to do also. And Jesus even added, greater things than these shall ye do. Jesus plainly taught that every man is an inlet to the mind and the spirit and the power of God. And he also taught that since we are inlets to this divine power, we can, if we will, become outlets to it. The last 50 years research into the hidden powers of mind and spirit have given us evidence that everyone has a transcendent power of the mind. But just what is this elusive thing we call our mind? I think the answer to this is simple enough. It seems to me that God, the living spirit, can be thought of as a universal mind flowing through everything and the divine power animating everything and an infinite energy energizing everything. The mind of God as a divine presence is so close to us that it really is our own mind. I think there is one mind. That mind is God. That mind is our mind right now. I think there is one life. That life is God and that life is our life right now. There is one peace and poise and one power that belong to us now. Let's take this simple thought then. There is one mind, that mind is God, that mind is my mind. And believing this to be true, let's just see how we are using this mind. In the first place, are we denying it or are we accept accepting it? You see, more than everything else, Jesus emphasized the thought that God is all there is and more than anyone else, Jesus proved his claim. He reached out and touched God in things and in people. And as he did this, the miracle of life took place. The sick were healed. The multitude was fed. The innumerable other signs and wonders that he did followed his belief. Naturally, everyone thought that this man must have had a power which other people do not possess. Somehow or other, we all seem to have overlooked the fact that Jesus actually told us that he did not have a power 
which was withheld from others. He told us that he was using a power which everyone has. And since Jesus was the one who was able to make his claim good, he is the one we ought to follow. And I have no doubt but that our own well-being and the salvation of the world as never before depends on an ever-increasing number of people trying to find out just what it was that Jesus was talking about, coming to believe in his claim and learning to practice the few simple thoughts and ideas that he gave us. Now Jesus spent a lot of time alone with himself and with God, out on the desert and in the mountain or in the secret chamber of his own thought. And how many of us really are practicing the presence of God? How many of us have learned to leave our confusion long enough to enter into peace how many of us have laid all fear and doubt aside long enough to draw faith and confidence into our being through communing with the divine spirit? But the place that you and I contact this mind, which is the mind of God, is and must be at the very center of our own being because here is the inlet and we must learn to draw in before we can give up. Nothing can hinder us but ourselves. You and I can have faith if we decide to have it. We can be lovable and kind if we wish to be. We can turn away from fear and doubt if we will to. But of course, before we can do this, we must believe that we are working with an absolute certainty. Now this will to believe, I couldn't give you, you couldn't give it to me. No one could give it to us. For how can someone else give us what we already have? You see, the gift of life, this gift was made before ever you and I were born into this world. It came with us. It has been waiting through all these years of doubt, waiting on our acceptance. This is why Jesus so often said to people, or asked them, do you believe that I can heal you? So often he said, your faith can and has made you whole. Now the mind cannot be filled with faith if it is full of doubt. It cannot be at peace if it is confused. Let us take this thing out of the realm of theory or some beautiful sentiment that sounds good but produces no result. You and I want to know, and we want to know with certainty that there is a place within each one of us, a place where we may dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. Let us then daily take time to practice believing that we are an inlet to the mind of God and believing that there is a love that coming direct from the heart of the universe can flow out from us in every direction, blessing everything it touches, believing that there is a certainty that can overcome every confusion and a faith that can destroy all fear when it comes to actual practice. We must remember that thoughts are things and that we really give direction to a power that is greater than we are. We must understand that this power operates through, in, and upon our words. It operates on our prayers and our affirmations and our meditations. And in so doing, it acts like a law of good it is something you can depend on with complete certainty. If then we are confronted with confusion, let's just get quiet within and say, but God is not confused. Why should I be? Let's say I believe there is an infinite peace flowing through me. And I am letting this peace flow out into everything I do. 
Moreover, I am stating definitely to each and every confusion in my mind and to any confusion around me, be still and know that I am God. And let's know that when we say be still and know, something is going to happen something definite and positive and sure, because it will, if we let it. And when we don't know just what to do, let's say, but the mind of God in me does know what to do. It not only knows what to do, it is flowing through me right now, telling me what to do. And it is not only telling me what to do, it is impelling me to do it. When you say to yourself, something within me knows what to do and impels me to do it, you can then turn to any thought that denies this. You can say, now you got out of here. You don't belong to me, just run away and mind your own business. I will have nothing to do with you. If you do this, you will very soon discover that your affirmative thoughts rub out or erase the negative ones. They just aren't there anymore. And so do it, just do it. And gradually a certainty will come to you, an assurance. And with it, you will see signs following your own belief. And these signs will be definite and positive. You will see conditions change with the change of your own belief and the time will surely come when you will no longer flounder around in doubt or despair for you will have learned the great secret of secrets the secret of life itself you are one with God right now And now that we have had our lesson, in a moment we are going to see if we cannot draw so close to the Spirit that it will flow through us with power and love. But just before we do this, I want to ask if you are studying the lessons we have been sending you, and are you studying them every day? And are you using the instructions which these lessons contain? I am sure you must be, but I think there are a great many of you who haven't sent for your lessons. Won't you do this today? The whole purpose of this program is not to exploit a person or a creed or a belief, but to teach you how to use the spiritual power that already is within you. And I want to be sure that you are doing this, that you are getting the most out of this program. You see, we meet only for a brief period each Sunday, but there are six other days in the week. And I want to be certain that your home study courses are being studied and that you are applying these great truths in helping yourself and in helping others. Before Dr. Holmes brings you his meditation for today, may I say another word about the home study course which Dr. Holmes spoke about. This course of 12 lessons on how to use the power for good is made available exclusively to you through this radio program. These lessons cannot be obtained elsewhere. This home study course is offered to you to supplement Dr. Holmes' radio talks. These lessons show you how you can apply the principles and ideas which Dr. Holmes discusses with you each Sunday to help solve your own daily problems. Join the many thousands of men and women who are enrolled in this home study course of the year and receiving their lessons regularly. This week, a letter or penny postcard addressed to This Thing Called Life, Los Angeles 5, will bring you absolutely free 
Lesson 6, entitled The Sense Life and the Inner Life. When you receive Lesson 6, you will also learn how you may obtain copies of the previous five lessons. In addition, this week you may also send for Dr. Holmes' July calendar of daily thoughts. 31 affirmations for every day in July. Write for your free copy of Lesson 6 and your July calendar of daily thoughts at once. That address again is This Thing Called Life, Los Angeles 5. Let us take as the thought for our meditation today these words from Psalms. They that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Now seeking the Lord means finding the place within us where we are one with the divine. That secret place within us which is the source of our life. As we thoughtfully repeat the following words together, let us feel then that we are both seeking and finding the supreme source of our being. Realizing that I am one with God and believing that my mind is an inlet to the spirit, knowing that the spirit is all power and all presence, I now open my consciousness to the inflowing of this presence and this power. And I say to my mind, you are to listen. You are to be still and know. You are to accept and to receive the divine benediction of love, of peace, of joy, and of happiness. And as you receive, so are you to give. I say to my mind, be still and know that there is nothing to fear. There is no reason for doubt. There is no uncertainty in God. And I say to my mind, there is a pattern of perfection at the center of your being. There is something here complete and po whole and perfect and wonderful and you are to let this divine person within you manifest in everything you do, in everything you say and think. And I say to my mind, love abides at the center of your being, love and divine givingness. You are to receive this love and you are to give it out to others. There shall be nothing unlovely in your experience ever again. 